Hello and welcome to another episode of Nakoa's Lunchtime Lies. Now this is a series of live interviews that we do on the Nakoa social media pages where I interview inspiring people that have helped COAs and Nakoa. And in this interview, we speak to the incredible and highly loved patron that is Geraldine James. Perhaps a career highlight for me to interview somebody like Geraldine James. Uh, and this interview really didn't, doesn't disappoint. It's such a powerful interview. Um, Geraldine talks about what life was like for her and her experiences and why Nakoa is so important to her in the way that it is. And she talks about how actually some of her acting career and her skills in being able to pretend were probably born out of some of those experiences of what it was like, what it was like to grow up with a parent that drinks too much. Seriously, get yourself nice and comfortable and make sure you sit down and give yourself some time to watch this whole interview because it really is a moving, emotive and powerful one. Make sure if you haven't done so already that you do come and follow us on all of the platforms that you use. We are Nakoa UK on most of your favorite platforms. I'm sure by searching us there, you'll be able to find us and maybe catch one of these live. Chat, there you go. Oh, that was easy. Look at that. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. I'm very well, thank you. Very happy to be here. Uh, um, we are very yeah, happy to have good. you. How are you? Good, so, so very good. good. And um, it's very good to see you looking amazing and very clearly, unlike last time when we had the... It was a storm, that, I think. It was an incredible storm and it just takes out our Wi-Fi like that. And I, I mean, it was, it's just ludicrous. And it was such bad luck because, of course, it cleared up immediately. We were, <laughs> yeah. all, we were all up and running about 10 minutes later. So it was ever thus. <laughs> yeah, always the way, right? Absolutely. Um, Look, it's, it feels really, really special, actually, to have been able to get to a place where we've been able to get you back. Like, we said that we would do it, that we would get you back. Um, and I don't know, I think it says something about COAs, right, that here we are doing it again um, and being it's, able to talk. It's in great, this way. isn't it? It's funny to have started the sort of first part of my life being completely ashamed of it. And now I feel I feel really proud to 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 be sort of open out as a COA and incredibly proud of my link with Nakoa. Um, and I'm so grateful for everything you do. And you're incredible, Josh. You're absolutely brilliant. I've seen lots Thank of you. these um, lives and I really think they're helpful and good and interesting and, and revealing. And that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, I just wish it had been there when, when I was a girl. Yeah. Yeah. I think, look, I think, all of us wish that we had something like Nicole when we were younger, right? Because we'd be able to, um, we'd have been able to feel a little bit more open about it. And for people that don't know, because obviously there'll be loads of people joining from your profile as well, right? You've been one of the longest serving Nicole patrons now um, for, for as long as you have. But you used interesting terminology just then where you said that you've been out as a COA, right? um now for for a long time can you just tell us about when that happened did that happen when you when you discovered nakoa or was it before no um nakoa got in touch with me i was on desert island discs and i I'd, mm -hmm. I'd known uh, and that was not that long ago i'd been acting i'd been around for a while um and i knew i wanted to to talk about my mother's drinking and the effect it had had on me and the effect, effect that that effect has had on me as an actor and as a person. And I had a moderately bad experience with the written press. So I made this possibly rather careless decision that I would speak about it for the first time on Desert, on Desert Island Discs. And Sue Lawley was interviewing me. and <laughs> She got the fright of her life. And she was saying, what do you, your mother, you keep saying your mother wasn't very well. What did you mean? And I said, my mother drank. She was an alcoholic. And, and she just, she sort of went, and she dealt with it absolutely brilliantly. She was sweet, but it did come a bit left field for her. I hadn't, I just, I didn't want somebody to interpret what I was saying in the written word. I wanted to actually be able to speak it in my own words. Of course, it then got picked up by the press and thrown around all over the place. Um, but, but that's what happens. And, and that's the risk you take when you, when you talk about something that's deeply personal press love to get hold of it and and do what they want to with it um 
So that's how it came about. And after Desert Island Discs, I got a message from Hilary, uh, your founder and our founder, and just saying, we'd, we'd be very interested to know whether you'd like to be join Nicole as a patron. I just said, I would be absolutely thrilled. And that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's a few years ago now, but that's how it sort of first came out. Was, was the reaction from the press, was it like negative? Are you talking about negative? like stuff that was said about you or was it seen as like a strength to come out and talk about it at yeah. the time it was seen as a confession of weakness and of difficulty and it was thrown at me and i got to the point where i refused to do any written interviews because i knew it would just be the headline was always fear of uh, uh, doesn't you know this actor who's been in this that and the other is frightened of becoming an alcoholic because her mother was you know come on there's more to it than that it's not it's mm -hmm. they sort of reduce everything to the red banner top of the paper and and looking for a for a soundbite um and alcohol is uh, it, you know, things have changed a lot since then, but but then it was ooh, good, you know, it was like they were going goody. There's something we can really get at her about. So it was entirely mm -hmm. negative, horrible, and I I sort of regretted it. Although in in the long run, I, I obviously don't regret it because I think it's very important. But it was it it well, it got to a point where I actually wouldn't do any articles for people i do spoken interviews but i wouldn't and then when people would always mention they said and your mother was not oh, yes and i and i try and just sort of go yeah i've talked about that quite a lot that's been spoken about and try to just get over it simply and truthfully but again it was very often stretched out into something when you actually spoke it and i guess there's like an extra layer for you as somebody who's who knew you must have known when you spoke about it, right, this is going to get picked up. But did you feel a sense of empowerment at the time? Was it, or was it, Oh, did it come yes. out? And... No, 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 I, pla I thought this is what I'm going to, I'm going to say it now. I'm going to say it at some point in this interview when I'm talking about my family history, because, I, you know, people do Desert Island Discs because they want to appear to be something. I just decided to do it and be truthful about it myself so that entailed speaking about my mother because that was an enormously important part of my childhood and my growing up and my becoming an adult um so i decided i I'd, I'd speak about it i didn't know how i'd speak about it i didn't know how or where or when it would come out um and mm. afterwards sue Lord, i remember her saying you're going to get a lot of reaction about that um uh, you know, well done you for saying it, stand by because you're going to get a huge reaction. I didn't get a huge reaction at all. I got a very positive reaction from people. It was only the, the, the gossipy papers who wanted to get in there and find out about it in the way yeah. they do. Yeah, 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 of course. And are you able to tell us a little bit about what it was like as a child with the, in the environment that you, that you lived in? Yeah. <clears throat> I came from a very, come from a very privileged background. My father was a cardiologist and we had a very big, fantastic house outside Maidenhead with enormous house with attics and cellars and, and huge gardens and absolutely idyllic to all intents and purposes. I was the middle of three children. I have an older brother and a younger sister. And we thought mummy was hilarious because she used to, pick us up from school and we'd end up in the hedge and the vicar would have to come and get us because she was too drunk to drive us. Um, and we didn't know that was strange. Uh, that's to us, that's what our completely beloved mum was like. She was a very sweet, simple Irish girl who came over to do nursing before the war and met my father uh, um, at Guy's Hospital during the war. And they got married and they should never have got married. And they had three children. And I think the drinking started. I think my mum couldn't cope. She was, she came from Monaghan, County Monaghan in Ireland. 
and medics in those days were incredibly sociable. I've got all these photos of her in these amazing ball gowns at these parties with my dad, who was very good looking, very sort of suave and successful. He had a car, which was unheard of. <clears throat> and I think she started drinking in order to cope. They were, they, they were always having cocktail parties. You always had a gin and tonic before lunch and often before lunch, uh, before lunch and definitely in the evening. Uh, we didn't have wine, or they didn't have wine at dinner, um, but certainly uh, the cocktail hour was quite an important thing in that society. Um, very sociable. And I think, I think my mum was very shy and very quiet and, and very Irish and incredibly nice. She was such a sweet person. And I think it was all very overwhelming for her. And she started... Uh, my father said that when, when, before they had any children, I think they were up in Hull working in a hospital and he said he, he used to like a glass of whiskey in the evening and he just started noticing that the whiskey was getting more and more diluted and he thought, what's, what's going on with this whiskey? So he, he started marking the bottle and then it got, re it got, the mark never went down. <laughs> it was sort of almost water. And she was just having a little nip of whiskey and then filling it up with water. So she wasn't discovered. And I think it all, it all happened pretty quickly and it went very badly. Very, she was very ill very quickly. And by the time I was about seven, she was going off to rehab. Uh, endlessly or thing and and eventually she she through through um aa and god she found god in a very big way and she had at least 10 years 15 years of being completely sober and utterly wow. wonderful and tragically got alzheimer's which apparently can happen um and we can all get alzheimer's but it's all, it can be linked to alcohol um wow. and she died when she was 76. Wow. Uh, but we, the, last, uh, the last few years we had together was fabulous. And she was, she was amazing and incredibly strong because she'd been chucked out. My dad got rid of her and bought her a little flat in Putney on the hill. And she got nothing in the divorce. She got a terrible settlement. Um, she had to look after us in our school holidays. And she, you know, that was all quite overwhelming. We had hideous Christmases where we'd turn up and, She'd forgotten to buy any food for Christmas and was completely out of her head. And it's it's so horrible, you know. Um, so we went through, there's a sort of gallows humour around people who are very drunk when you're with a brother and sister who are the only people you can really talk to about it, who, can, who share it with you. Um, so we were very, very close, the three of us, and just went through this it's it's horrible it's horrible and it, when you get older you know what's you realize what's going on and i remember meeting a woman from wimbledon aa and um i thought she was terrible because i thought i i'll do i can cope with this i'll do it i'll get her off the alcohol so i have always felt like a failure and no good because I couldn't stop my mother's drinking and neither could my brother and neither could my my father gave up. He just said, I can't cope with this and got rid of her. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a brutal and terrible thing to go through. But unfortunately, an awful lot of us have gone through it. Mm. Wait, wait, how old do you think you were when, because you said there was like, it was almost sort of humorous when she would pick you up and be like she, she was because you know, you know, as a child, you know, I reflect on my own experience. You don't know that it wasn't normal. I tell people, you know, I say, when you hear my story when I was a child, particularly early years when I first started school and before, I never wished that things were different because I didn't know that they could be, of course, right? Of I, didn't, course. I had no idea. Do, do you remember a time in your life when you started to see that, it, you know, it could be a different way or that it perhaps wasn't supposed to be the way that it was? I remember being at, uh, I was at a, a junior school with my sister. We were at a primary school in, in Maidenhead. And that's where mummy used to pick us up in her little car. No seatbelts. Um, mm. and, and I remember noticing that none of my friends would come and play with me, would come back from school with me. And then somebody said, I've been told not to. 
And I, why not? Why can't, what's wrong with us? Why can't they come back? We've got this wonderful house. Um, and then I remember a girl saying once, and this is before, I went to boarding school when I was 11. So this is before that. I remember saying, has your mother got a headache today? And I, and I, I, I said, I don't, I, I, well, yes, actually she has. When she has a headache, she goes to bed and we cope with that. But I suddenly started seeing myself and our situation from the outside, from, from people around us. Um, mm. And it was a terrible shock one day when we were all, because my brother went to boarding school when he was seven, poor thing. Um, but we were all together at, at home and sitting in the sitting room and mummy was upstairs in bed and my father was there. And I remember Richard, my brother saying, mummy's drunk, isn't she? And daddy immediately smacked him across the face and said, never use that word in this house again. And being completely shocked, A, that my father had responded like that, but B, that Richard had actually said it He'd got out, he'd, he'd said it, the word that was so sort of awful and horrible. And it meant it was true. It meant that all our sort of fears that we probably kept completely to ourselves were actually, yes, the, the answer was, yes, she is drunk and we need to help her and we need to do something about it. That was never the case in our family. It was, shush, how dare you say that word? That is our secret and you do not tell a soul. And that's a terrible thing to put on a child. Um, mm -hmm. And my sister was nearly two years younger than me, so it was worse for her. Um, and I think when I went to boarding school, I, I don't think I talked about it. I, I just don't think I did. I don't think I felt I could. I know when I met my husband, um, which was when I was at drama school, just after drama school, he used to say to me, you never talk about yourself. Tell me about you. And I just sort of be completely clammed up and it took years it took serious analysis to actually allow me to talk about it openly and freely um that that that, that not talking about it right and and, and the fact that you know to, to, for anybody from the outside looking in right to utter the sentence um she's drunk isn't she when 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 i say it with my experience right I can feel that in my heart. I can feel that, like it makes my whole body go like breathless, yeah, like straight on me when you say it. But to anybody looking in from the outside, right, it may seem like a relatively small thing, but we, to know that it was that big, did, how do you think you learned as a child, and maybe this is gonna be too difficult to articulate, but how do you think you learned as a child not to talk? Was it explicitly said, we don't talk about this, nobody talk about it? Or do you think it was more sort of under the under the sort of uh, under the carpet stuff that you picked up on and had a knowing about? I'm not sure that it, I mean, it was. It was definitely talked about then when Richard said it. We were told categorically not to. But I think before that, I'd sort of picked up that we don't talk about this. We never. If we were sitting and having supper, and Mummy wasn't there because she was upstairs in bed. We never went, why, what, what's the matter with mummy? Why is she not here? We just took it and, and it was unspoken. I mean, it was definitely a secret in our house. And I think secrets are terrible things to have in a family with young children, because it, if there's a secret, it becomes my fault. You know, I'm, mm. I can't talk about this because there's something deeply wrong with it and therefore with me. And I, I must just, pretend and of course I learned very well how to pretend um and I think I mean that's obviously where where the, I suppose where the acting started from um which is which is awful actually yeah with like I, I wanted to come on to talk about that right and and the influence that that probably had on you I recognized that in myself right my, my ability to kind of perform and I think w when you talk about that not talking and the secrets, right, I vividly remember my mum after, you know, the, the morning after something terrible had happened. And it wasn't, it wasn't even like it was a, let's not talk about last night. It, there was like an over the top, everything's okay and you go about your business, right? And so you, it's not just a secret, right? It's actually, 
like a big emotion that comes with this secret that you have to push down and trap in your body. And I think yeah. you learn, you learn to um, act and perform a different way to that. You learn how to act, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I I think I think you learn I think you see what's going on around you on a slightly different level. Because you're because you're hiding things, you go into a place where you can see recognize in others that they're hiding something as well. Perhaps. Maybe that's where a sort of empathy comes from because I I've got a I've got these terrible antennae. I can walk into a room and sort of pick up what's, what's going on in the room because I, I have had to be, all my life, I've had to be incredibly alert to, you know, how are things going in here? Is it an arguing day? Is it a drunk day? Is it a headache day? Is it a bed day? Is it a, oh, we're all sitting here being all right day? And, and suss the situation and deal with it instantly and immediately and successfully. Mm. So friends who the people who wouldn't come and play with me were the people whose parents had heard that my mother was a drinker and understandably had said you're not going back with them you're not going in that car you're not going to that house because we don't know what's going to happen um it wasn't the children you know the children as far as they were concerned i think i was you know i was perfectly bouncy and i had to because my father was very driven i had to be very successful at school i had to win the races i had to come you know, to come second in class was a disappointment. Um, and that that put, that means you've got to create something as well of being successful. You've got to be seen to be bright and clever. Um, mm. and, and funnily enough, the first time I was offered a, a really good part, when I was about eight, we did something called The Music Man at school. And, and the teacher had heard me singing and she said, I want, I want you to play the lead. I want you to play the lead part. And I couldn't I couldn't do any of it I couldn't couldn't do it I could not stand up in front of people and just sing it was much too revealing it was much too open it was much too upsetting and um and I didn't do it I couldn't do it I had to be replaced and that I I was so ashamed of that that I hadn't been able to do that but that wasn't because that was about singing is a revealing of yourself acting is putting something on I mean of course it's wow amazing. That you're also revealing something of yourself, of course you are. Um, but I, I think acting was speaking Shakespeare or doing a poem or, or performing something in somebody else's words to open my heart and sing was, was impossible. Wow. That's, it, I, I've, I've never heard that, 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 that the singing is the revealing and the acting is putting something on. I've never, I've never thought of that before. I mean, I sing in a choir now, which I absolutely love, but I get fantastically emotional. I just, I just cry if we're singing something that touches me. I just, I have to stop and hide. <laughs> I just, I find it so emotional and revealing. You know, this is uh, stick with me because this is like relates. I always had this fascination. You know, the singing competitions on TV that you watch. Over the years, I used to watch them, right? And when, you know, when like somebody would finish singing and they'd never sang in front of people before and then there would be like a standing ovation. I used to be like hypnotized with it. And it used to make me cry when I watched it, right? And I remember, I used to think through my mind, why, am I, why do I like this so much? Why am I so obsessed with like the X Factor and stuff like that? Yeah. And, 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 and I remember uttering to myself, I wish I could be seen in that way. And that is exactly what you're talking about, right? Because yeah we go in we we are forced into hiding right at a very young age rather than being supported into finding who we are yeah. we're forced into hiding and i loved drama right when i was a kid right and still do right i love acting and performing i mean i do it in a different way kind of now um but the the, the difference is that joy that i find of putting something on and feeling protected and being seen right and was acting, yeah. was acting like that for you? Was acting respite? Was it good or was it gruelling to do it? Uh, it was incredibly gruelling to do it. I was at a boarding school from 11 to 18. And I, I well, I used to be a bit of a, cl a school clown. And um, very when I was very low down in the school, uh, I, I used to do a sort of terrible showing off thing uh, after Friday lunch where I had a pencil tin 
that had a wonky lid. And I used to do a sort of comedy routine, a silent routine with this, with this lid of this pencil case popping up. And people used to just sit around and watch and laugh. And it was fantastic. And it was, that, was, that was a performance and I felt totally confident doing it, but it, from a very, it wasn't me. I, was, I knew how to be this funny person who could make people laugh. Um, and one day the teacher came in and saw me and she said to me, she said, I'm putting you in the school play. And I, I lost my voice. I couldn't speak. When I, I played Rich the Second and I, I could not, I, my voice completely went and I used to, I still have problems with my voice, but I used to be, I've always been very nervous and, and I always went through a process of, of the sort of nerves taking over and wrecking things. But I, once I discovered Shakespeare and sort of dressing up, I suppose, and it was school plays and, and of course it was people saying, you're you're quite you could do you you're quite not you could do this at all but you're quite good that's good mm. he suddenly went what moi you know so it was completely <laughs> i'm i'm what you're good really i mean i it was so sort of extraordinary and i i sort of blossomed in that um and then then started doing school plays constantly and stayed on and and did a sort of a sort of shadowy e uh, A level because I wanted to play Malvolio and Richard II and all the rest of them at school, all girls' school, of course. So I was tall, so I played all the boys, uh, which was great. Um, so that's that's when I discovered n not self confidence, but a way of a way of being all right. People actually saying you're okay, and that was fantastic for me because I'd never had it. And do you think that like helped you through having that, that kind of validation that you were good at something? Or was there like a disconnect from it? Something said? No, uh, at a school like this, the one I went to, you had to be good at something. You had to find whether it was Latin or playing the cello or whatever it was, gardening. You had to find your niche in the school and those big girls schools. It's a very different school now, it's great. But I wasn't good enough at art. I wasn't good enough at singing. I wasn't good enough, I played the clarinet uselessly in the back of the orchestra but i i was okay at acting so it th that's what i attached myself to i don't know if that I can't, i'm not sure that that answers what you've said actually josh but... no 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 it, it does it, it totally does and i think the hyper vigilance that you talked about at the beginning right of this little s segment here i that probably helped in the acting as well right because i know with me i'm able to do where i can see such subtleties in in other people I'm able to kind of introduce those subtleties to myself as well, like knowing that I'll be able to sort of uh, help change a mood in a way without people being able to notice I've done it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I'm fascinated by this, this hypervigilance because I'd never heard that phrase. And my daughter's an art therapist and she actually talked to me. She said, she told me I was a bit hypervigilant. And it's, it's amazing because that's absolutely what we are, isn't it? We just mm. sort of, we're on there, we connect with, and, and if, I'm, if I'm acting a part, I will go and sit in the tube, sit in a carriage in the tube and just look, and just look at people and just see if I can find the person I'm looking for who I'm going to be. Um, and really sort of study people. And, and that's, that's great. That's an aspect of the job that I absolutely love. It, it, and it's one of them things, right, where that sort of, that hypervigilance, that level of sensitivity, when I look, when I reflect on my own life has become, it's an absolute gift, like I call it a superhero, right? Um, but it can be a curse as well, right? When, oh, I, yes. when I feel like I'm constantly taking responsibility for everybody else as well. And this kind of links to what you said, I, want, I just want to pick up on it. Um, when your mum got sober, you talked about how you like, um, you couldn't be the one that fixed her or saved her or, or got her sober. Um, so how old were you when your mum got sober? She came down... Was it adulthood down... or childhood? Oh, yeah, no, 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 adulthood. Uh, she came right. down when I was working in Rapid Exeter in 1973. Uh, she came down on the train and I had to literally scoop her off the train this complete wreck came off the train 
I then had a very weird experience um, the following year in about 74, 75, where I suddenly thought of her in the middle of doing a play. I was playing Raina in Arms and the Man at Exeter. And, and I suddenly thought of my mum, and this was Exeter, this is no motorways, I didn't have a car, um, a long way away. <clears throat> and I just found somebody in the company who was coming to London, and I thought, I've got to see my mum. And I got a lift to, to, to quite near where I lived, and I walked back, and, and I got back to our house in Putney, to her flat, and there was, I just saw blood on the doorstep and on the door, the handle. And I thought, here we go. And I was 75, 25, 26, and yeah, went in, up, went yeah. into the flat, and there was blood all over the telephone table. And I went upstairs and I thought, I'm going to go in and I'm, I'm going to find my mother in the most terrible state. And she was completely comatose out on her bed, fully dressed, and her hand her, was scraped and bleeding. And that's what the very minor damage. And I cleared, I cleaned her up and I put her to bed. And I hadn't seen her for a while because I'd been in rep and you, you just never get away in rep because you're working all the time. And um, in the morning, I went to bed in the spare room and I got woken up by my mum standing in the door in the morning and she said, you came. And she said, I just thought about you. I was at rock bottom yesterday and I was just thinking about you and thinking I want to see Geraldine. And I, I was, I was, I got it. And I think that was the beginning of her getting herself together because she found a sort of belief that we we were all there for her <clears throat> um and with and with god and all the, the 12 steps you know the aa thing mm -hmm. so that's where that's when it began it took a while but it began and and just suddenly she was she was genuinely right she wasn't drinking she'd done it and so she died when I was 37. So it was about, it was about 10 years. Wow. And we, used, we used to have um, a celebration because I gave up smoking. Uh, I think she gave up drinking on the 2nd of March and I gave up smoking on the 3rd of March, but sort of quite a few years after her. So we used to celebrate together and I'd have a large drink and she'd have a cigarette, but we were celebrating each other's not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and she was i mean she was miraculous because she was on her own completely on her own mm. um, <clears throat> and had a lot of friends was very popular and was utterly delightful and i still dream of her i dream that i bump into her on putney hill and go oh i had no idea you i'm sorry i haven't been to see you so long she's been dead for whatever she's 40 years something awful um so so it was a, a really miraculous getting herself together and she did it herself she did it and was it did you struggle in that initial time then with when she got sober did you struggle like because i sensed earlier on that you said that there was almost a little bit of a battle that it wasn't you the one that got her sober oh uh, I, be, I became her jailer at one point i came back from rep i think and i came back to london i had nowhere to live so i went to stay with my mum and she was drinking and I thought, I'm going to do this. So I used to, f I knew where she hid all the bottles. I used to tip them all down the loo. She had tablets that were obviously doing her the, a lot of good. I thought they were terrible. I threw them down the loo. I, I wouldn't let her out. Um, I, all, I mean, I was, it was a terrible, terrible thing to do. But I thought, I, I've got to do it. I've got time. I'm not working. I've got to, to help her get over this. And eventually somebody came and talked to me from AA and said this is you know you're just making your life and she I mean she became violent with me at one point because I was I mean I was horrid I was horrid to her because it's you know you go, why why are you why do you have to keep doing this why are you ruining your own life never mind ours yours um and so I I it was a horrible time it was a few months of being really terrible and very very angry she was very angry with me and she'd sort of lurk behind the kitchen door and jump out at me and attack me and and somebody thank god came and just said that is really not the way to do this um and she went into a place near ascot uh and and there was a doctor i can't remember his name began with g um in ealing somewhere in a hospital and he was fantastic he he helped her a lot 
and and but it was it was I didn't help her at all. But I I I thought I it's got to be you know because it's our fault. It must be our fault that we're not making her life happy enough for her to manage it without drinking. So mm. the least I can do is get her through it. I can support her through it. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And it, that's the kind I think probably and I can ask you, but why Nakoa probably resonates so deeply, right? Because what Nakoa does is, I think, really well is are very clear that there's that there's not necessarily a fix here, right? They don't sell any false ideas. It's more like what we can do is be with you and support you through what you're experiencing. Because what you've just described, for me, is, you know, it's almost becomes a version of addiction in itself, right? You suffer yeah. in a different way, but it's almost like it's the same illness in the end, right? Because you're so pulled in and entrapped by it and you know in some ways you're fighting the same fight that your mum was fighting right but you like yes absolutely disconnected from okay. yeah yes that's true yes. so when when did can I, I i feel like i need to say something as well i feel like um i feel like you did a lot right in in in, in terms of like the healing journey that your mum must have gone on right and as a result that you went on it feels like it was something that you did together right I mean, that moment that you had when you were on stage and you thought about your mum, what do you, do you ever think about what that is? Of course. That moment. It, it happened, it happened again a few years later. Joe and I were sitting down with his brother and his wife for Sunday lunch and I'd spoken to mummy that morning and asked her to come and have lunch with us. We were in Battersea, she was in Putney. And this was just a couple of years before she died. And, um, and I said, you want to come for lunch? And she didn't want to come for lunch. And we were just sitting down to eat. And I said, I'm really sorry. I've got to go and see mummy. And Jenny, my sister-in-law, said, I'll come with you. And we went over to Putney. Her front door was open. The gas rings were unlit but on. And she wasn't there. And we just looked around, couldn't find her anywhere. And this was January. And uh, spoke to her neighbours. They hadn't seen her. One of them said you do know how ill your mother is, don't you? She's completely sober at this point, but has dementia. And, and she just, she said, you, you don't realize quite how ill your mother is. And, and I went, no, I suppose I don't, if you're telling me that. And we couldn't find her anywhere. And it was this, there were downstairs flats, and there were upstairs flats, and she was in a downstairs flat. And Jenny was up on the upstairs where there were balconies, asking up there. And she suddenly called down to me and she said, is that your mum? And I looked across the street and this man was walking along with this old barefoot lady, bent completely double, going along, going, is it that one? Is it that one? And this poor man had found her wandering around Putney Heath, waiting for her ship. She, she wanted to find her ship and go. Um, and uh, that we took her. She came to live with us then for a bit, and then my sister and my brother. And, and um, but but that I mean, why? Why did I get that absolute flash that I had to go and see her? And I really did have to go and see her because you know, if the neighbours hadn't been about, she didn't know where she lived. And that was the first time we'd encountered that where the mind has completely gone and she totally lost it. Um, so I and I'm so, I'm so grateful to have had that connection with her because both of those times were incredibly important. Yeah, I did, see, the, the reason I asked it is because I do think that level of intuition, right, that level of being in tune with the people that we love and care about is something that I think people like us that have had these kind of experiences, only we can sort of understand, if you know what I mean, because it sort of goes beyond comprehension, right? I think if you were just a, a normal average person was listening to us speak and saying that we were so in tune with someone who was so far away. But I know and I, I know, I know when I'm really in tune with something that that kind of thing can happen. And it's, so in some ways, it's, it's sort of not even worth trying to explain, right? Because it just no. makes sense to us. It, it, yes, but then when she died, I didn't know. She died mm. without... And it was, that was when I got the phone call saying, uh, I'm so sorry to have to tell you, your mother passed away at four o'clock this morning. 
And it was such an unbelievable shock because we'd just got her settled. She was at a fantastic home that were really sweet and good and brilliant nurses. Uh, and she was very contented there and very happy. But the, the last time I saw her, uh, Ellie, my daughter, who's now 37, was, was not two. And we went into this sitting room of this, of this old person's home and um, they were all sitting around. And Ellie, my daughter, was incredibly close to my mum and got on very well with her because they were about the same middle age then. And, um, and I remember watching Ellie walking into the room and her grandmother was sitting over there and she wandered around and she didn't recognise my mother because my mother wasn't there. She was just, you know, she and Ellie didn't see her, didn't recognise her. And that could have been a warning, but that was on the Sunday and, and she died on, the, on Wednesday. Um, and they just rang up. So I, I felt I let myself down that I didn't have that connection, but maybe she didn't want me to know. Maybe she just wanted to go quietly and not. Mm. Yeah, and we, I think we take so much on ourselves, right? Because, because we lived a life where that's what we did, right? We took, I know for me, when I reflect on myself, I should speak just myself. As a child, I learned to take responsibility for, in my sense, not just for my dad, but I took a lot of responsibility and my dad was the drinker and I took a lot of responsibility for my mum and the way that my mum felt, you know, and I've always lived a life and, 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 and knowing uh, um, rationally is one thing, but it still plays out, right? Where I feel so responsible for the people around me and the ways that they feel, right? That um, I probably carry the burden of things that I perhaps shouldn't in that way. Um, yeah. What's yes, your... I think I can be a bit of a control freak, maybe because of the same thing. Maybe because of, I mean, my husband would tell you, I'm a complete control freak. Um, because I, I want things to be as the best they can be. And if mm. they fall, fall I, get a bit, I get a bit impatient, particularly with the increasing years, I find. Um, yeah, but I, and again, right? Again, if you lived a life um, when we were, discovering who we were and when we were building ourselves as a person right if we lived in a world where so much of uh, what impacted how we felt was out of our control then how incredible that we developed a, a sense of finding control in things that we could find control in exactly. you know what i mean in some ways yeah. i think it's like i'm almost grateful that we found those things because there was a part of us that loved us enough to help us find them you know yes what what's your because uh, I'm, I'm i'm aware of time and i don't want to keep you uh too long but that's fine what's your what's your journey just if you could summarize what has the sort of like journey to who you are today looked like have you had to do a lot of i don't know work whatever work is to to be the person that you are today and to kind of i, I don't know find some kind of healing i i just i feel so incredibly fortunate and and blessed that I've had the career I've had because it's put me in touch with a lot of amazing people and a lot of amazing places and I've you know I've, ha I've had an incredible life incredible including all the tough bits because they founded and they created the person and if I'd known that if I'd known you're going to be all right um, I, I don't know what difference it would have made but it might have helped a bit um, and I think all the, all the nasty bits have, have, I, mean, I saw an osteopath the other day who's brilliant, the cranial osteopath. And he said, are you very lonely? And I said, no, abs absolutely not. I'm, I, no, I don't feel remotely lonely. And he said, to me, you feel like a lonely person. And I thought, how weird. And I, I was then a couple of weeks later, I was with an acupuncturist, <laughs> like my treatments. Um, and I said to her, who's a great, great friend, and I've known her for years, and I said, I saw this osteopath, and he asked me if I was lonely. And she said, I understand exactly what he means. I, I felt that about you when, you when I first met you. Uh, then you told me your story, and then I understood why. So that pain as a child creates a sort of hole, I suppose. Um, and... I've always had to be very self-sufficient, I suppose. 
Uh, I love, I was in Canada filming f over the last few years, every year for six months. And I literally loved, missed my family terribly, but I loved being in a city alone and just exploring and being by myself. I love being by myself. And I think that's, that's part of it. That's come out of this extraordinary experience. But I, I just feel incredibly lucky that I found acting because acting actually made everything that I was and am useful. I can use it, not in a cynical, not in a cold hearted way, but I, I sort of fall back on it and I, I can find pain very easily in myself. I can't play a drunk, interestingly. I, I, I did a part in Inspector Morse, so I had to play a drunk. I was absolutely hopeless because it was just, I don't know if it was too close or something, but I, I could not be a convincing drunk. Make of that what you will, but anyway. Um, <laughs> on the whole, the parts I played, I've sort of found bits of myself that I can use. And that's, that's amazing to have that sort of, to have that all going on in you and in your past that you can go, oh, I remember that. And that's what's one of the great things about getting older is you've just got all that wealth of experience and memories and uh, just sort of things you can fall back into and, and bring out again is, is mm. it's wonderful as well as sometimes being very painful. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of, children that have you know children affected by parents drinking um will resonate one with those parts of ourselves right that we sort of almost create throughout our lives yeah to to, to make ourselves what we feel acceptable to the environment that we're in right i think i sort of almost always congratulate myself and, and other people that i meet that manage to do that for themselves and that loneliness there's a, quite a few people i've seen in the comments were like saying that that loneliness that they resonate with that that loneliness or, or that ability to be alone, right? Which is yeah. probably more what it's like. And I, I think in a lot of ways that's to do with that empathy, that real strong empathy that we've got. When I'm around a lot of people, I feel so in tune with them and it can be so exhausting because I'm so, that like rather than sort of expressing just who I am, right? Completely who I am. I find it very hard not to self-manage who I am in order to who I'm with and so yes. let them be them and be but totally turn your interest into them so yeah. that Joe will say to me when we if we go out to he says it's so easy for you you're so good at all that small talk and I said well start I don't think it is small talk actually but it's it's just I said I'm genuinely interested in people now mm. maybe what that is is I'm just turning the beam off myself um I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a funny thing because I know there's a contradiction in being an actor because in being an actor, I love having an audience. I love, I love being particularly on stage um, because I'm creating that world um, and and the sort of challenges of of who I'm going to be this time uh, is is incredibly exciting and and still happening, which is amazing and fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that comes back to the actor and the singing thing that you talked about at the beginning, right? When you said that the the singing is revealing ourselves and the acting is putting on something and going forth and sharing that version of ourselves that we've been able to create. I know I love walking about London on my own because yeah. I get to be around loads of people and I get to tune into whoever I want to, right? But I'm almost anonymous, so I don't have to then alter myself. So I get to do it with my own free will. Um, so I love that. How interesting. I've never known that anybody else felt like that. How funny. Isn't that great? Yeah. Good. It's, look, it's, it's incredible things for us. Look, I'm going to start to bring the, There's always a question that I like to like to finish with. Um, and I like to ask everybody. You, you may, have, may have seen me do it. But if you could go back to the little girl that you were, let's say, I don't know, nine years old or around that age when you were sort of discovering the things that you were discovering about how your mum was. If you could go back there and say to that, that little girl that you were anything, what do you think you would say to them? Talk about it. Mm. Talk about it. Speak about it. It's all yeah. right. Oh, you know, because I just remember the, I remember pain. I remember the, the sort of full frontal, if you like, pain of being 
closed like that, of not, not being able to express the fear, the hurt. And, and if, you know, when we talk, it's like when we sing, we open our hearts, we open out. And if I'd been able to open out to somebody and be brave enough to actually say, um, then it, I wouldn't have been beaten up as I imagined I would be, as I thought, you know, it must mm. be my fault. It must be me. Therefore, if I talk about it, somebody's going to go, oh, you horrid little girl. And it, that was too frightening because too many people were already saying to me, you're a horrid little girl. So, so that, that, that's what I'd say is talk mm. about it. That's why I'm such a keen uh, supporter of Nakoa because I, I meet people. I met somebody fairly recently whose sister has started drinking very heavily and has two young boys. And I said, please just give them this number and ask them to drink. I don't know if they did, that's, that's not for me, but I, I can point them in the right direction. And I do because I know how much Nakoa helps people. And I just, I just go, thank God Nakoa is there. And how dare the government stop their bloody um, support for them. It's absolutely disgraceful. Because they need, you know, Nakoa is, is important and needs to be, it's, it's already very, very highly respected, but it needs to be helped, you know, mm. um, to, yeah. to do the work it does. So, so it's, it's about talking about it, opening up about it, and that's what Nakoa does. Um, mm. And look, that's why, you know, we've existed for the amount of time that we have almost solely on donations and, and volunteers, right? Because of... Um, people like yourselves and, and, and everybody that's able to kind of raise that awareness. And I resonate exactly with what you say, you know, to be able for me to now, especially with, and when you look at the funding, what it did, what we were able to do with the website now. So when I do say to somebody, go and look at the website and there's this incredible, like plethora of, of places that these people can go. Uh, if people understood the impact that that could have on the, the little me, and there's loads of little me's and loads of little you's out there. Yeah. then they i think they would see how you know ridiculous it is that that and it's just it's such a small amount of money um oh, no. you know <laughs> relatively speaking that the co need um look i'm gonna finish it here because we're, we're sort of nearly up to that hour um and I, i've taken a lot of your time and energy already it's been um, great. i've really enjoyed talking to you yeah likewise uh, likewise it means so much to me and it will mean so much to so many people being able to watch it and like i I tell everybody that comes on here, don't please don't underestimate the impact it will have to to have people like yourselves reflecting on your own experience in that way. So thank you for everything, not just today, everything you've done in the past and what you continue to do for us. Um, and look, hopefully I'll get to see you in person soon at a Nakoa event. Uh, we will yeah. next. All right, next Josh. Year. Oh, All right. Good to see you. you Thanks. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye everyone.